It's a trap. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Black Magic Craft. This is going to be the first in a multi-part series of videos focusing on traps. Now, I've had people requesting trap tiles and trap features basically since the beginning of this channel. And I've always decided to not do it. Uh, not just in terms of not doing it for the channel, but not doing it as a DM at my table. My reasoning for this is such that I've always felt traps themselves are such a momentary feature or item in a game that they don't justify a full-fledged piece of terrain to represent them. And that those are the kinds of things that should be left to theater of the mind. You have your uh, terrain laid out and people doing their thing. And if all of a sudden the floor opens and they fall into a 10 foot pit, I never felt the need to actually craft that little bit because it could just be narrative. However, I've been swayed. And the reason that I've kind of changed my opinion on the matter is thanks to one of my Patreon supporters in the Black Magic Craft Fellowship group. Uh, George, this is your fault. Uh, George, who's been one of my great supporters on Patreon and an active member in the fellowship, posted some photos of some stuff he was working on. And he had posted a photo of a little spike pit trap that he had made. And this was the kind of thing that, you know, I've always said should just be narrative. But honestly, it just looked so cool that I was tempted to build it. And I thought about it a little bit and my reasoning I still thought was sound that it can be a narrative quick moment. But then I started to think about the trap as a bit of a obstacle or terrain or another character in the encounter once the trap is sprung. So what I mean by that is the floor opens, make a deck save or fall onto some spikes. That can be a fun little narrative thing, but if the trap doesn't reset, or I guess even if it does, the party could then use that trap later as a tool to get monsters to fall into or whatever, or it could be another threat to the party that's ongoing and therefore it makes sense to have it as a static item on the game table. With this in mind, I started developing a base system on which to build traps. You know me, I like to keep my stuff standardized and modular so that everything kind of has a format. And basically what I came up with was some very thin little features that could replace three by three tiles on the board. I made a very active decision not to make a two part kind of tile that you could open up and reveal a trap because that would stand out and could look different and players could spot it. I don't think it was really necessary. So essentially I wanted to make tiles that were their own that you could pull a tile out and replace it with the trap that's been sprung. And I came up with a system that I think was pretty good. Essentially it comes down to having a flat tile, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, on which to build your various traps. So on this episode, I'm gonna show you how I made these. Now these are, there's not much to them. They are essentially just a thin tile with some sludgy water and plant life that represents a pit trap. No spikes, no razor blades, no crushing walls, nothing. Just the, the basic fundamental pit trap. And in later episodes, I'll show you how to take these and build upon them for more elaborate and interesting trap ideas. The most important thing when developing these for me was to make them as thin as possible, which I'll explain in a moment, and make them as flat as possible. And I'm pretty happy with what I came up with uh, to the point that these can actually sit on top of tiles instead of replacing them if you'd like because they're so thin. So anyways, let's go over to the workbench and I'll show you what I came up with. So as a basis for our pit trap here and the other traps that I'm going to do moving forward in videos, the basic premise is just a three by three square, same as my basic dungeon tiles. It's going to function as a replacement tile that fits right into the same 
format so that you can use it when you lay out your tiles without disturbing the format. Now, I know some people will talk about uh, wanting to do traps where they actually have a tile where you can lift and reveal or do something. I, I think that's unnecessary. I also think that it can make those tiles recognizable. So the idea for me is to just have something that you can remove a tile and then drop in whatever the trap is. So the most basic of traps, this pit trap, I essentially just want to mimic depth and a fall and some debris and water and whatever's at the bottom of this thing. Now, obviously you are going to be limited by the thickness of your tiles. And if you're like me using half inch, the lowest this drop could be is half inch. But you know, if you have some difference in height, you know, your players can then, you know, imagine the rest, you can tell them it's a 10 foot drop or 20 or whatever it is. But the idea is to have some sort of depth. Obviously then you want to be able to make your trap on a tile that is as thin as possible. Now for me, I've achieved this and I've gotten my trap to be, you know, no more than two millimeters thick. It is very thin so that I can take advantage of the full thickness of the tiles. What I use as my foundation are these Formica samples. This is countertop material. You know, it's about maybe not even two millimeters thick. It is extremely hard. It is very flat. It gives me a very flat, thin surface to work on. Now, the challenge there, because anybody can pick this stuff up, you can walk into a Home Depot and go up and just grab some samples, or you can go into a countertop company and ask them. I have hundreds of these things from, you know, my profession in renovations, but anybody can get these. The challenge with them is, is cutting it, which I'm gonna to touch upon in a moment. You don't need to use that. You just need to use something as thin as you can that you are comfortable working with. You could just take some XPS foam like I've done here and rip it down a bit thinner on the Proxon table and to about a quarter inch thick and you know cover it in Mod Podge to make it a little harder and that will still give you some drop. You could in theory use the like dollar store foam core board, but I find that you're gonna probably end up with some warpage, but you can do it and I'll touch upon when we get to the resin, how you can kind of prevent some of that warpage. Another great alternative would be some plywood or MDF. If you use some, you know, or hard, hard, hardy backboard, um, like chipboard, whatever, basically something that is as thin as possible that you can cut into three by three squares fairly easily. And that is going to reduce warpage as much as possible. This Formica, that is, in my opinion, the absolute best thing, but it has some serious kind of difficulties in cutting it that you have to be, first of all, comfortable doing and have the correct tools to do it. But that's how I do it. And I'm gonna show you the tool I use to make that happen. To cut this stuff, you are not really gonna be able to do it with a knife or scissors. It, it is way too stiff to cut with a utility knife. Scissors or shears will just crack it and flake it. You have to cut this with a saw of some kind, a power tool. You can absolutely cut this on your standard table saw that you would you know, use in your workshop. If you have a table saw and you're comfortable using it, then you should also know correct kind of procedure to cut material this thin. And I'm not gonna touch on that here. I'm gonna say if you don't know how to cut this on a table saw, don't do it. I don't really want to be going outside and setting up my big table saw to do this. So I'm gonna make use of this amazingly cute little table saw that Proxon sent me. It is a small table saw with this really tiny blade that is meant for cutting small hobby materials. The blade cuts through this stuff perfectly, gives me a really nice edge. I'm gonna use it here. Uh, it's on my desk and I don't need to set anything up. If you'd like to pick one of these up, I'll put a link, an Amazon affiliate link in the description of the vi video. This is a fantastic hobby tool, but it is also not a requirement. It's one of those things that if you're really serious in the hobby, you will get a lot of mileage out of if you're really passive and just kind of do stuff once in a while. It's probably not for you. If you build a lot of stuff, this thing is amazing. The one limitation, however, and it's just, <laughs> 
because of the size of tile I want to make three inches by three inches, this table saw is so small that the rip fence maxes out at, what is it? I believe two and a half inches. So I can't actually use this rip fence as it, as it's, you know, made at three inches. I think I will at some point just like make a modified one at three inches because that's my standard. It's just that the, it falls off the guide at that point. So for this, I actually have to freehand it, but I'm really comfortable doing that because I've worked on table saws my whole life. So I can do a nice straight freehand cut. On the back of this, I've penciled off my three inch by three inch square, and I'm just gonna freehand rip this, and I'm gonna put on some safety glasses because I don't want any shards of this little Formica jabbing me in the eyeball holes. Oh, also I'm going to do something that I don't necessarily recommend and I'm going to do it without the safety guard up so that I can see my line. Again, if you know what you're doing, this is fine. If you don't know what you're doing, maybe stick with a different material and a different tool. Now I have this perfect three by three square with a beautiful cut edge. Like I said, I'm freehanding it. I'm using this guard up. I don't recommend that unless you are very skilled and comfortable with table saws. So this is really like kind of like an advanced procedure here, but sometimes the advanced material and procedure gives the best results and I don't want to sacrifice best results just for the sake of the channel. This is for my game and I want it to be perfect. If you're thinking about getting one of these, uh, I would recommend maybe doing what I'm gonna do and make a three inch guide because then you don't have to freehand it and you can use this guard down if there was a guide. Or if you're working in a different format, two by two, using this rip fence, this becomes a very safe, easy tool to use. I Ripping something through like this, I would recommend for anybody, even if they're you know new, it's not that bad. It's just the freehand cuts require some extra intuitive skills that you know take you know years of practice to learn. But anyways, we're gonna proceed to actually making the fun part of the traps here. All right, so now the fun part, turning your little tile into a cool slimy pool of gooey water like this. If you used foam or something, it's a good idea to coat stuff in Mod Podge first, especially these edges uh, to make it a little bit stronger. And you're probably gonna wanna paint things out underneath. It's mostly gonna get covered by the water, but the goal is to have translucent uh, kind of swirling water to show some depth. You don't want it to just look like paint blobbed on that's a bit shiny which means that you will kind of see the substrate underneath through it a little bit. I spray painted my tile gray so that it just, you know, looks like anything seeing through sees stone underneath. I could have, in theory, depending on the exact sample of Formica I used, just left the pattern on it because, as you can see, like this had like a stone pattern. I could have used that but for the sake of consistency as well as to cover up the text from the sample that actually landed on this piece I didn't want that text showing through I spray painted it out whatever tile you use you know paint it out basically gray don't you know be too thorough with it and now you can mix up the water so I'm going to move these out of the way and I'm going to go probably with a slightly different look on this one than this one this one's very brown and I might do something different here and the foundation for this is gonna be this five minute epoxy that I buy at uh, Dollarama. You can buy this probably at any dollar store, pound store, five and dime, whatever. And it's just a basic five minute clear epoxy that you wanna use. If you are having trouble finding it, I posted a link to a comparable product, just another brand on my Amazon uh, affiliate shop. So you can grab it through there. I'll put a link in the description. Now, because we're gonna be doing this epoxy right to the edge, it's gonna be difficult to handle this. So I'm gonna use uh, the same thing I use for minis uh, to hold this. And basically it's just a pill bottle that I filled with sand for some weight. 
and some hot glue so the st sand stays at the bottom. Some blue poster tack or sticky tack. I'm gonna press this in and now I will have a handle to work with and you know a place for this to sit and dry. You will also want to have some embellishments prepared. I'm going to use some of this, these little like vines from this moss. This is the moss you can get at any craft store or dollar store. And I'm just going to break off a few pieces to make it look like there's some plant life and vines growing in this pit of sludge, uh, as well as just, you know, some coarse flocking to make a little bit of shrubbery. In this one, I actually put some little branches and logs, you know, that you know, got trapped when this pit had been opened, but obviously it doesn't make sense to have logs in all of them because how many logs are there in a dungeon? Depends on the dungeon. A uh, great place to use your bits box for minis, put some skulls, put some bodies, put some skeleton parts, whatever you want to dress it up. That's where the fun comes in. But I'm gonna keep this one simple to just show you the water and the greenery. So I'm gonna take my five minute epoxy, I'm gonna use this little clear disposable shot glass and I'm just gonna pour a bunch of this stuff into here and you're gonna have to guess about how much you need I'm gonna say that's about good you know obviously if you're making several of these you can make a bigger batch you want to stir this up really really well and when you stir this kind of epoxy up you can see it turns silver for a moment and that's the two chemicals meeting each other and the chemical reaction already starting to take place remember this is five minute epoxy you only have about five minutes to work with this stuff, so don't mix too big of a batch at once. I like to give it a good little bit of a stir first and then uh, add some paint. And now the amount of paint you wanna add is so incredibly minimal, it's actually difficult to add such a small amount, but just the tiniest of drops and less is more. You can always add more later, but remember that you want things to be translucent and there that is starting to look like a nice sludge and you can add a little bit of brown as well if you want green brown whatever you want and just experiment until you're happy then you can take this stuff pour some out onto your tile don't overdo it and just spread it around with a popsicle stick. And I'm actually thinking here, it looks like I could maybe make this a little bit darker. So I'm gonna add a bit more paint because I don't want too much of that gray showing through. And I can already feel holding that shot glass, it's starting to get really warm because the chemical reaction hardening this uh, works through heat. So once you start feeling that heat, you know you are already running low on time. But the nice thing is that this will be table ready <laughs> within, you know, several minutes. You don't have to wait days for this stuff to cure. It looks like I mixed up just the right amount and this shot glass is getting very hot right now. If you use something like foam core where there's a risk of warpage, this resin, when it dries, will be rock hard and it will actually, you know, your tile will stay whatever shape it was when the resin cured. So if you make sure to attach your foam core or whatever material you're using that might warp to something flat so that it holds flat while this resin is curing, that'll ensure that you have uh, a nice flat unwarped tile at the end. So now before this stuff completely hardens on me, I'm just gonna drop in some greenery little bits of plant life that's growing here. And I don't really want to overdo it. Take some of these vines, have them maybe growing out of the spots where I put some little shrubberies. I'm gonna use a toothpick to push it into the resin so that I don't get my fingers all covered in goo. And this, like most projects I do, is gonna be a matter of taste of how much of this you want to do. You could do absolutely none, or you could cover the whole thing. It's, it all depends on how you want it to look. Now I know somebody out there is going to say, well, but if this is like a pit trap in a dark dungeon and it's just, you know, this hole in the ground where there's no light, there wouldn't be any plant life growing. And it's like, well, 
Sure. If we're talking about the real world, that's true, but we're talking about Dungeon Dragons in a fantasy world where an eyeball beast that shoots lasers from his eyes lives. So, again, don't get stuck on real world limitations here. And that's already starting to harden up, and I think I'm going to call that done. So we're going to come back in about 5-10 minutes and take a look at it once it's hard. All right, so it's been about 10 minutes since I put down this epoxy, went, ate two slices of pizza, came back, and the resin is now cured and hard. It is still very slightly tacky, so immediately after I would be careful about really pushing it and getting fingerprints embedded on it, but it is hard, and if you let it sit for, I'd say probably about another hour, it's gonna be 100% cured, and you can touch it, and it's fine, so. This is something you can actually make fairly last minute uh, before a game if you need to and have some pretty cool results. One thing you can also do, which I will do on this one and I've done on previous ones, is actually to spray everything after with polyurethane, but a gloss polyurethane. Now, obviously, as you can see by all the reflection off this resin, you don't need that for the wet look of the water, but any kind of little details that you've added, like these vines and shrubs or sticks or whatever you've put in there, the polyurethane spray will actually protect those and you know make them a bit harder, but it will also make them look wet, right? It's gonna give that wet look over the whole thing and the gloss is gonna go right over this resin and keep it looking nice and shiny and wet. Just make sure you do it with a gloss, not a satin or even a semi-gloss. You want this to look as wet as possible. Uh, and then that's really it. Then you're done and ready for the table. So there you have it guys. That is what I came up with as a foundation point for basic dungeon tile traps. And like I mentioned before, in future episodes in the series, I'm going to build more elaborate and interesting little trap details like spikes and various other things. So put your comments below of the type of trap that you would like to see made. Something that maybe you use a lot in your games or that you've just been struggling with how to make yourself because I will absolutely consider them when moving forward in this series. As usual, if you found this video useful, hit that like button and let me know in the comments below. Hit subscribe if you aren't already a subscriber. I put out new videos every Friday for you guys. And the reason I'm able to put out those videos every Friday is because of the support, the very generous support of the people on Patreon. I highly encourage you to consider taking a look at my Patreon page, seeing what it's all about, and seeing how it helps me in creating these videos. The best part about that little group there is that people who pledge at the $5 a month level become automatic members of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship and get granted access to a private little Facebook community where we hang out, discuss stuff, and come up with cool ideas, brainstorm, share tips and tricks, and inspire me to make stuff like this. These, this video would never have been made if it wasn't for the members of that little Patreon group. So I highly encourage you to go check it out and become a member and a supporter. It'll be good for you and it will be excellent for me because that help is so important for this channel to keep going at this pace. Another way you can support the channel if you'd like is by purchasing things through my Amazon affiliate links. On blackmagicraft.ca, I have my essential equipment store. In the links to most of my videos, I have links to products that I use. Clicking and buying those links ensures you get the correct product for the task, things that I stand behind and recommend fully. And Amazon pays Black Magic Craft a small commission on any of those sales and those little commissions add up to actual revenue that I can use to keep this channel going and you know what, to help provide for my family a little bit and justify the time lost on my Saturdays when I'm making these videos for you guys. 
and I would love it if these videos continue for years to come because I love making them and I love hanging out with you guys. So until next week, cheers, happy crafting. I hope you have an awesome game this weekend and just keep on being awesome guys. Peace out.